Today's webinar is titled Exploring Silvicultural Strategies in Our Changing Forest, Eastern Hemlock and Northern White Cedar. Our presenter today is Laura Kenefek. Laura is a research forester with USDA Forest Service Northern Research Station and a lead scientist at the Penobscot Experimental Forest in Maine. She has been working with the Forest Service for more than 20 years and currently leads the Mixed Wood Ecology and Management Research Team in the Northeast and Lake States. Laura is a silviculturalist by training with a bachelor's degree from SUNY Binghamton, an MS from SUNY ESF in Syracuse, and a PhD from the University of Maine. Her research in silviculture of northern conifers and northern hardwoods is focused on long-term experiments with mixed species stands. Please join me this morning in welcoming Dr. Laura Kenefek. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm so pleased that you're joining me today to talk about eastern hemlock and northern white cedar. My plan for this presentation is to share what I know in order to help you understand and manage these species in northern New England. I'd like to start by reviewing some basics about the two species. Eastern hemlock is found from the Lake States to the Atlantic provinces and south through the Mid-Atlantic states. Here in northern New England, we are close to the northern range limit of this species. The distribution of northern white cedar also spans the Lake States to Atlantic provinces, but in this case, we're not far from the southern edge of its contiguous range. Cedar occurs north and west of us in Canada. This map shows the distribution of the two species and their overlap. When I was first asked to give this presentation, it seemed like it might be challenging. I was thinking about eastern hemlock and white cedar. Those aren't two species that I usually talk about in the same sentence. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that these species have a lot in common. The overlap of their distributions, which is the dark olive green, occurs right over our region. So this is a great place to talk about eastern hemlock and northern white cedar. In order to understand management potentials and limitations, I think it's important to review these tree silvical properties. Eastern hemlock, or Tsuga canadensis, is also called Canadian hemlock, or hemlock spruce, which is actually pretty confusing. It is the state tree of Pennsylvania. It is very shade tolerant, long-lived, easily growing more than 400 years in our forest. It produces abundant seeds every two to three years, and seedlings establish best on moist microsites. Unfortunately, from a commodity production perspective, Hemlock has a tendency to develop ring shake. This occurs when the wood separates lengthwise along the annual rings. It is the result of growth stresses and decreases the strength, integrity, and aesthetics of the wood. Lastly, eastern hemlock is impacted regionally by the hemlock woolly adelgid, but we'll touch more on that later. Northern white cedar, or Thuya occidentalis, is also called eastern white cedar in Canada, or eastern arborvitae, and arborvitae means the tree of life. It is mid to very shade tolerant, again, very long-lived, surpassing 400 years, over 1,000 years on the Niagara Escarpment. It produces abundant seeds every two to five years, and it regenerates by seedlings or by layering on wet sites when the branches or a fallen bowl um, roots with the ground and forms a new tree. Interestingly, cedar has very weak and brittle wood and is prone to decay when living. We don't usually think about that because it's extremely resistant to decay after death. I think we should consider the damaging agents such as insects and diseases before we talk much more about these trees. Eastern hemlock has a long list of potential problems, including the hemlock looper, borer, needle rust, needle miners, shoot blight, woolly adelgid, and the elongate hemlock scale. Northern white cedar is already managed, is prone to heart rot when living. It is also affected by the arborvitae needle leaf miner, which can cause dieback of the foliage, but rarely mortality. So I put a picture of the arborvitae leaf miner here because um, there weren't a lot of other pests to fill up the northern white cedar side of the slide. So this is an important way that these two species differ. <laughs> 
Hemlock woolly adelgid is an important cause of regional hemlock growth losses and mortality. The map here on the left shows predicted basal area losses in New England over the next decade. It was created by the U.S. Forest Service. And we see that for hemlock woolly adelgid, these range from none in the northernmost part of our range to as much as 15%. Hemlock woolly adelgid is expected to, to move north and result in increased hemlock mortality due to climate change. This topic will be covered in more detail in an upcoming webinar by Dave Orwig, so we're not going to focus on it today, but it is a serious pest and cause for concern. And I encourage you to attend Dave's presentation to hear more about that. When we consider eastern hemlock and northern white cedar, we need to understand the cultural values of these species. Historically, hemlock has been important to Native Americans. It is medicinal and high in vitamin C. Hemlock leaves are used to make tea, which is taken for rheumatism, cough, and cold. Hemlock poultices are applied for soreness and made from the inner bark of the tree. Hemlock cambium was traditionally used as a base for breads and soups and mixed with berries and animal fat to make pemmican. The bark can also be used to create a reddish-brown dye. European settlers also made use of hemlock, mostly for construction lumber and for tanning. The beam shown here on the left was recently recovered from a New England barn that had been built in 1840, and it's, that's a really old um, hemlock tree right in the middle. It had been 300 years old when they put it in the barn, so it had started growing in the um, 1500s. Most notably, hemlock bark is very rich in tannins, which are used to tan hides for leather. Bark was stripped, ground, and soaked in water to leach chemicals, and the wood was often left in the forest to rot. Tanning was a major industry in the Northeast starting in the 1700s, peaking in the late 1800s, at which time natural tannins were re replaced with synthetics. Cedar also has numerous cultural values. It is well known as a component of wooden canoes and was used in construction of arrow shafts. Cedar was made into common household items such as the Penobscot ring and pin game shown here, which was constructed from moose hide, white cedar twigs, and twine. White cedar leaves are high in vitamin C and used to make tea and a salve for the skin. The bark was used for rope, fabric, and baskets, and as tinder for starting fires. White cedar is considered purifying. It is used in ceremonies and sweat lodges by Mi'kmaq and Maliseet peoples. It is one of four sacred plants featured in Native American folklore. Glooscap, the creator of the Wabanaki people, is shown here turning a man into a cedar tree in a birch bark illustration from the 1800s. Perhaps the first known use of white cedar by Europeans was Jacques Cartier, who used white cedar to treat his crew for scurvy on the advice of First Nations people in 1534. White cedar was later used by European settlers as an antiviral agent and for roof beams, fences, and shingles. The market for cedar shingles was strong throughout the pioneer period. For example, 110 million cedar shingles were shipped from the city of Bangor, Maine in 1850. Cedar was also preferred for railroad ties due to its resistance to decay. Demand for cedar increased in the late 1800s and early 1900s as the railroads expanded. Contemporary use of eastern hemlock is affected by ring shake, which limits its utility. It is used today most commonly for construction lumber, mulch due to its slow rate of decay, and pulp. Because it has short fibers, hemlock pulp is used primarily for newsprint and wrapping paper. High demand continues for white cedar for shingles, posts, and mulch. It is also used for essential oils, decorative items, fences, furniture, and log homes. <clears throat> 
The largest cedar shingle mill in North America is in St. Pomfield, Quebec, just over the main border. It sources much of its wood from northern New England. With regard to value, distance to market can be a limiting factor. For northern white cedar, shingle mills will use trees with as little as four inches of sound wood outside a hollow core, but transportation costs for low quality material or less than full loads can be impediments. Hemlock is often used for stud wood and other construction lumber, but in the absence of ready mills, even sound and saw timber sized hemlock trees may be pulped reducing the value of the wood. Currently, prices for softwood pulp are very low and the wood can't be sold in some markets this spring. Northern white cedar is enjoying high value and is in fact worth more than hemlock, spruce, or fir in some parts of our region at this time. In addition to commodity production, both hemlock and white cedar have notable biodiversity values. Eastern hemlock is regarded as a foundation species, that is one which influences its environment to a greater degree than would be expected based on its abundance alone. In addition to birds and squirrels among others, eastern hemlock is important to porcupine as a food source and to white-tailed deer. The dense shade of hemlock stands provides shelter for wintering deer and it is integral to the habitat of brook trout which was originally called hemlock trout because of its occurrence along stream corridors. Eastern hemlock is heavily browsed by white-tailed deer in some areas, leading to recruitment failures. Cedar is also an important species for wildlife, frequently used for nesting due to its anti-parasitic properties and cavity excavation. It provides habitat to a number of birds, including more than a dozen species of warblers. In particular, cedar trees are an important component of deer wintering habitat and are a preferred winter browse. This has implications both for cedar management and resource sustainability. Cedar trees are also often associated with unique habitats that support rare plants, such as the globally imperiled ram's head lady slipper, which is shown here. Many states are working toward increasing deer population levels, largely in response to public desire for more deer. Targets in Maine, for example, specify that deer densities be increased 1.5 to 5 times depending on locality, mostly by protecting and increasing deer wintering areas. This is a highly political issue and is receiving a lot of press. This might be a problem for sustaining eastern hemlock and northern white cedar, because excessive browsing has been implicated in recruitment failures of these species throughout the Northeast and the Lake States. So I'm now going to take just a brief pause to make sure there aren't any pressing questions before we continue on to the research presentation. Great, thanks Laura. We'll just give a minute to see if anybody has any questions. As a quick reminder, if you do have any questions, uh, please go ahead and type them into the question box in your control panel. I don't see any questions, Laura, so I think we're good. Great. Good. I'm glad that I haven't made any glaring mistakes so far. So let's move on to the next portion of the presentation where I talk about what we've learned about these two species. There are concerns about sustainability of northern white cedar and eastern hemlock in light of the competing demands for cultural values, wildlife habitat, and commodity production. It is essential that white cedar and eastern hemlock be managed sustainably. But there are questions about regeneration and recruitment, growth and yield, and responses to silvicultural treatment. To help address these knowledge gaps, I'm going to share some observations from our long-term research on ecology and management of eastern hemlock and northern white cedar. This work is based on studies conducted by the U.S. Forest Service and cooperators in Maine and elsewhere in eastern coniferous and mixed wood, hardwood softwood mixtures. This work builds on spruce fir research presented earlier in the seminar series by Bob Seymour of the University of Maine. 
Our work on hemlock focuses primarily on the Penobscot Experimental Forest in Maine. This is a 3,800-acre property located in East Central Maine, about 10 miles from Bangor. It is owned by the University of Maine Foundation and is designated by the Chief of the Forest Service as a site for long-term experimentation. The U.S. Forest Service has been conducting research there since 1950, giving us more than 60 years of research. The Penobscot Experimental Forest is one of 80 experimental forests and ranges nationwide that the Forest Service maintains. This one is one of 22 in the northern region, the only one in the eastern spruce fir or northern conifer forest type. The PEF, as we call it, is in the Acadian forest region. Common species include eastern hemlock, balsam fir, spruce, mostly red, but some white and black, northern white cedar, eastern white pine, and hardwoods, such as maple, birch, and aspen species. Small-scale disturbances predominate, and the return interval for natural stand-replacing disturbances, such as fire, can exceed 1,000 years. These small-scale disturbances with periodic heavier disturbances due to spruce budworm outbreaks result in a complex species mixture and forest age structure. When our work began on the forest in 1950, tree species composition there was on average 30% hemlock, 20% balsam fir, 16% spruce, 12% white cedar, and the rest is minor species. So these were hemlock, fir, spruce, cedar forest. These photos were taken shortly before the Forest Service began their research in 1950. Stand reconstruction data suggests that though the property was never cleared or burned extensively in the areas where we are working, it was repeatedly partially cut. In fact, there was a mill on the site in the late 1700s and hundreds of mills on the nearby Penobscot and Stillwater rivers in the 1800s. At the time we started our work, the forest had not been harvested for more than 50 years. The structure was irregularly multi-aged with mature softwood dominated stands in the understory reinitiation phase of development. That means that the canopy was kind of breaking up and there was new regeneration becoming established. So a very heterogeneous and species diverse forest. The long-term silviculture experiment that I'm going to talk about today is the compartment management study. <clears throat> this is one of a number of studies that the Forest Service has been maintaining. This is the largest and the longest going from 1950 to the present. It is shown here on the map on the right. The management units outlined in cream are our stands that we use for studies. We call them compartments. Um, that's just an old term for um, a stand. Each stand averages about 20 acres in size. Every treatment we have is replicated at least twice at the stand level. And we use permanent sample plots measured every five to 10 years to measure regeneration, saplings, and trees. The treatments include variants of even age silviculture as two and three stage overstory removal with and without pre-commercial and commercial thinning, uneven age silviculture as single tree selection cutting on five, 10, and 20 year cutting cycles, and exploitative cutting this includes commercial clear cutting and fixed and modified diameter limit cutting. There is also a reference. And again, as I said, a minimum of two representatives of each treatment in the study. This morning, I'm going to focus on the three-stage uniform shelter wood, the five-year single tree selection, and the commercial clear cutting, giving us one example each of even and uneven age silviculture and removal-driven harvesting. So let's look at what happened in each of these. The uniform shelter wood was applied with a three-stage overstory removal consisting of a preparatory cut, an establishment cut, and a complete overstory removal. 
We see here how volume changed over time for all species combined. So we see the three cuts, so volume decreased once again, and then the last time the effect on hemlock volume is shown in red below the total species. There have been 10 to 11 years between the first and second cuts and 6 to 7 years between the second and third. The compositional goal was to increase the proportion of red spruce. The photograph on the lower left is what the stand structure is currently, a very high closed canopy with very little light coming to the forest floor. The two photos on the right show the stand immediately after overstory removal and then more recently with a very dense large sapling to small pole size stand and an open understory. No pre-commercial or commercial thinning here. The single tree selection treatment, on the other hand, was applied every five years from 1950 to the present. So we've had more than 12 entries. This is shown in the sawtooth graph here in volume change over time. We use a reverse J structural goal. This is the traditional diameter distribution that calls for a lot of small trees and a few large trees and is believed to confer sustainability to uneven age stands. And again, our compositional goal was to increase red spruce. We see from the canopy photo on the lower left that this is a somewhat more open canopy relative to the shelter wood. There are many small gaps due to single tree removals. This has resulted in a highly stratified stand with a wall of green appearance. Lastly, what we call a commercial clear cut. This is not a silvicultural clear cut. A silvicultural clear cut is where you take everything for the purpose of establishing new regeneration after the fact. Here, it was just a logger's choice, so an unregulated harvest, basically a clear cut of everything that was merchantable. There was no compositional goal, no residual stand targets. It was done twice, once in the 1950s, the volume regrew, we did it again in the 1980s. The second harvest, as you can see here from the graph, was much heavier. That's because merchantability standards changed at that time. The canopy is now very open and patchy, and the stand is dominated by a new cohort of shade intolerant hardwoods and sprouting red maple with scattered residual poor quality softwoods. So let's look at some of the results of these, comparing the three treatments with regard to eastern hemlock. When we look at the overstory, this is a percentage of hemlock basal area at the beginning of the study and now. In the uneven age stand, so this is the single tree selection, despite our efforts to reduce the proportion of hemlock and increase spruce, hemlock was our second priority for removal after high risk and low vigor trees, which were usually fir. We increased hemlock basal area. In the shelter wood and commercial clear cuts, on the other hand, hemlock was reduced over time. In the shelter wood, much of it came out during the preparatory and establishment cuts because it was not a preferred species for regeneration. What was present in the understory was quickly outcompeted by balsam fir and red spruce, and it's been languishing in the small sapling classes. The commercial clear cut removed almost all the hemlock and little has grown back in in this dense canopy of shade intolerant hardwoods. Here is growth in cubic feet per acre per year for all species, that's the total bar, and hemlock only, which is the dark portion. Growth so far has been comparable in the uneven and even age stands, so this is over approximately 65 years, but much less in the commercial clear cut. That's because we took out all the growing stock. Consistent with the previous slide, we see that a large proportion of the growth in the single tree selection is accounted for by eastern hemlock. Looking to the future, the density of hemlock seedlings has increased many fold in the single tree selection stand, but has been reduced in both the shelter wood and the commercial clear cut. As a proportion of seedlings, hemlock is now 25% in the selection stand, 13 in the shelter wood, 
and only 5% in the commercial clear cut. So what's going on with regeneration? In addition to the influence of seed sources, light, and competition, which can be accounted for by stand changes in the three example treatments we've used, substrate is also important. We did a paired plot study of deadwood and the adjacent forest floor and found that hemlock, and also spruce by the way, are relatively more abundant on wood than forest floor in all the treatments except the single tree selection. This is because hemlock establishment and early growth are better on moist substrates like deadwood or in the shaded understory of the selection stands. In more open stands, a lack of decayed deadwood substrate and inhospitable hardwood leaf litter, I'm thinking here of the commercial clear cut, can impede hemlock regeneration. Once hemlock seedlings are established, they have to grow for management to succeed. These data are for hundreds of hemlock seedlings that we uprooted and aged with a microscope at the root collar in different treatments on the PEF. So we have two selection treatments, a commercial clear cut, and an unharvested or reference area. What we found is that hemlock in partially cut stands grow very slowly taking, for example, anywhere from 15 years to 30 years to reach one foot in height. This graph, which is from Bob Seymour's work, shows the relationship between sapling annual height increment and proportion of open sky for hemlock, spruce, and fir. So these are metric units don't pay attention to that, it's just the relative comparison between the lines which matters. What we see is that hemlock, which I've just highlighted in green, has a height growth advantage, that's on the left side of the graph, until somewhere around 10% open sky, so that's 90% canopy closure. Then Red spruce and balsam fir, which are the other two lines on this graph, catch up. Beyond about 20% open sky, which would be 80% canopy closure, eastern hemlock height growth is surpassed by its shade tolerant conifer associates. All this suppression means that you can't relate hemlock age and size. This graph shows the relationship between diameter breast height and age for hemlock in two of our single tree selection stands. There is a pretty poor age size relationship, particularly in the saw timber classes. In fact, a 120 year old hemlock may be as small as 8 inches in diameter at breast height or as large as 20 inches. This matters for two reasons. First, it takes time to grow a merchantable tree, and that affects sustainability of production. Second, we know that hemlock growing, the hemlock become more growth efficient as they age. That is to say that a hemlock tree will grow less stem wood per unit of foliage when it is old than when it is young. So even though you can keep hemlock in the lower strata under suppression for a really long time, like way over a hundred years, those trees may ultimately have lower growth rates when they finally reach the canopy. In addition, we know that the growth dynamics of eastern hemlock and its softwood competitors are affected by canopy structure and growing space occupancy in uneven age stands. The image on the left shows the average tree height, crown length, and crown radii of red spruce on the left and eastern hemlock on the right in the selection stands on the Penobscot Experimental Forest. So this image is based on our actual measurements. There's a picture of this, conveniently, on the right that shows the same relationship. Though total height is similar in each stratum, crown size verges as the trees move up into the canopy. Despite similarities in shade tolerance and longevity, Eastern hemlock retains a lower and wider crown base than red spruce in the upper canopy, 
This has implications with regard to growth potential and the ability to occupy growing space and expand into openings. Clearly, a larger and longer crown allows eastern hemlock to capture a greater amount of the available growing space in these stands. That's one of the reasons why we saw hemlock basal area increasing over time in our selection stands, even though we kept trying to cut it out. It just loves those repeated light partial harvests. I want to take a minute to address spruce budworm, which might seem kind of weird for a hemlock discussion. Spruce budworm is a native disturbance agent in the Acadian forest. It is a defoliator that affects radial growth patterns. Defoliation can cause growth reduction, while changes in the canopy due to mortality of neighboring trees can result in release. Though balsam fir and spruce are preferred hosts, eastern hemlock also is defoliated at the height of outbreaks. So the graph shows the, ra the radial growth ring width over year for an example eastern hemlock tree from our forest. And what we see is periods of budworm cause suppression during the 19 teens and 1980s budworm outbreaks. However, over half of the red spruce in our sample, and here again we had 100 trees of each species, showed suppressed growth during the budworm outbreak. And now almost none of them showed increased growth. In comparison, 20% of the eastern hemlock trees showed reduced radial increment during the outbreak, and 20% showed a release. The other 60% were, weren't affected at all. So we see a mixture of positive and negative effects for hemlock across our sample population. So I'm going to stop here before we move on to northern white cedar. If anyone has any specific questions that they want to ask right now, um, I'm happy to take them. Great, just give a minute for questions to come in. Uh, a quick question, Laura, around uh, the three treatments on hemlock. How did you guys account for deer brows? Or did you account for So, um, yep, that is a really good question. We um, do not have historical data on deer browsing. However, we did do a browse survey um, less than 10 years ago. And what we found is that across our forest as a whole, um, about 7% of the hemlock seedlings had been browsed, while that number was for the seedling class alone 25% for cedar and um, over 30% for red spruce, interestingly. So relative to other forests, we don't have a big effect of browsing on hemlock at our site. Great, thanks. I don't know other questions at this time. Okay. Well, then I will continue. I'm going to switch gears now and talk about our work on northern white cedar. About 12 years ago, the U.S. Forest Service partnered with colleagues in Maine and Quebec to conduct cross-border studies on northern white cedar ecology and management. The silvicultural guide that resulted from that is shown here and is available from the U.S. Forest Service Tree Search website as a download for free. Participating institutions include the University of Maine, Laval, the Quebec Ministry, the Canadian Forest Service, among others. This group is called the Cedar Club. And I can now tell you from experience that as soon as you say that something is a club, a lot of people want to participate in it. So there's some advice. As with Hemlock, our work covered regeneration and recruitment, growth and yield, and responses to silvicultural treatment. Whoops. There we go. Let's start with tree growth. We used a retrospective analysis to study growth of white cedar trees, conducting stem analysis on more than 200 sapling and overstory trees from central and northern Maine and Quebec. These came from the woods and from the Maybeck St. Palmfield Mill Yard. They represent a range of site types and stand densities. So here's what we found, and this is a photograph of my colleague Bob Seymour with one of our um, samples. 80% of the cedar trees in our sample started out as suppressed and were then released. 
The initial period of suppression lasted on average for more than 60 years, but with good response to release, even in very old trees. Some trees responded to release after 200 years. Here is an example of radial increment in millimeters over time for a stump height cookie of a 13 inch cedar from the Maybach Mill Yard. It originated in 1650 and was 356 years old at the time of sampling. 13 inches, 356 years old. Here we see no release but increasing radial and basal area increment over more than 300 years. It was growing faster at 350 years old than it had been in its entire life. In fact, our colleagues in Quebec have observed that cedar growth rates tend to increase over time. A common pattern of development is multiple periods of suppression and release in response to disturbances such as cutting or the spruce budworm, which releases cedar when um, fir and spruce are defoliated or die around it, and increased light as the tree ascends into the canopy. Here is an example of release. This is a stump height cookie from a cedar tree that originated around 1900. This tree shows a period of initial suppression followed by release, then increased and sustained growth due to greater access to light. Our growth findings are summarized in this table. This is how many years it takes cedar to grow from stump height at one foot to different sizes. So here's the take home message from this. Cedar, on average, grow very slowly, taking, for example, almost 100 years to reach pole size and 170 years to reach shingle stock size. That is the bad news. The good news is that the range of growth rates observed is large. While one of our sample trees took close to 300 years to reach shingle stock size, shown on the bottom right, another got there in just 80 years. Given what we've observed about cedar's response to release, this suggests the effectiveness of silvicultural intervention. Let's turn to the influence of site on cedar growth and decay. I mentioned earlier that these trees are very often um, decay and have a hollow core. For this, we looked at 60 stands across central and northern Maine, and these are examples of the soil on some of our study sites. They covered a wide range of drainage conditions from very poorly drained, organic, to well-drained mineral soils. We recognized three basic habitats in our work related to soil drainage, and these are specific to cedar. Lowland habitats are swamps with moving groundwater. These are pure cedar or cedar-dominated. Mid-slope seepage sites have enriched groundwater and support cedar in mixture with other conifers like spruce and fir. And upland sites have cedar with hardwoods including yellow birch. And these are the most productive. So here's what we found. On average, cedar growth rates are similar to red spruce but slower than balsam fir. Cedar growth on seepage and upland sites is better than in swamps, and, and don't be tricked by this one, a greater proportion of cedar trees on seepage and upland sites are decayed. So at first thought didn't make any sense, like why is there more decay on the better sites? Our work suggests that this is due to the removal of sound trees in harvested stands on better sites, as well as logging damage to residual stems. Remember that, although very resistant to decay after death, Cedar is susceptible to damage and decay when living. So this is a function of past selective harvesting and logging operations, not site directly. What about regeneration of cedar? We found that on seepage and upland sites where cedar is growing in mixture, establishment and early growth is best on exposed mineral soil and decayed wood. This is because these are moisture-holding microsites that prevent the seedlings from drying out. Research on lowlands or swamps in the lake states suggests that establishment and early growth of cedar there is better on mounds than in pits or hollows. 
That is because early and late season flooding can inundate the roots, leading to high mortality. Our colleagues in Quebec also conducted a silvicultural experiment to investigate regeneration in managed stands. They applied treatments in mixed species stands of cedar, yellow birch, spruce, and fir. The pretreatment basal area was approximately 120 square feet per acre, and treatments included single tree selection cutting, which removed 95%, shelter wood, or, I'm sorry, 25%, 90 square foot per acre residual. A shelter wood, which removed 50% to a 60 square foot per acre residual, and a patch cutting, which created 90 foot diameter gaps, or 0.15 acres each. They found that establishment and early growth were best in the selection and shelter wood treatments. Patch cutting was the worst because the full sun in the gaps resulted in higher temperatures, desiccation, and more competing vegetation. However, growth of established seedlings, that would be at least one foot tall, was positively correlated with light and growth increased with increasing canopy openness. The best growth was in gaps. This suggests that gradual opening of the canopy will maximize early survival and later growth. We had a question earlier about herbivory. This is very important for northern white cedar in our forests here. As I mentioned earlier, browsing impacts by hemlock and cedar vary locally and regionally. We compared cedar regeneration in regions with no and close to 15 deer per square mile. In all stands, regardless of deer density, there are many cedar seedlings less than six inches tall. At the higher deer density, there are few seedlings six to 12 inches tall and almost none over a foot. So they all had been browsed. We've done some work on sapling recruitment at the Penobscot Experimental Forest, focusing on our partial harvests. As discussed earlier, these are conifer-dominated mixed wood with a small component of cedar. Deer density in that wildlife management district was estimated to be at least 15 per square mile, which is within the state's long-term post-hunt population goal. We observed that more than 90% of white cedar seedlings and small saplings had been browsed at the time of our study. Over 30 years at the Penobscot, we saw a more than 80% reduction in density of large cedar saplings. This is three to four inches in diameter at breast height. Reasons include browsing, logging damage, and competition. We averaged 28 large cedar saplings per acre in 1975 and five per acre in 2005. Over 60 years, density of merchantable cedar in these stands was reduced by 95% due to harvesting and lack of recruitment. These observations support the need to retain cedar seed trees, manage where and when deer densities are low, and protect and release cedar seedlings and saplings. An important part of forest management planning is identifying high conservation value areas such as old growth. FSC standards, for example, specify that old growth stands at least three acres in size with no history of harvest must be reserved. It's very hard to identify cedar old growth stands. You can't use age because so many of them are hollow and it takes 100 years just to reach merchantable size. We recently completed a study of 30 old growth and harvested cedar stands and determined that old growth cedar can be identified using a combination of average tree size and amount of highly decayed dead wood on the ground. We're currently working on a decision tree for practitioners that will make this determination at different probability levels, and that should be coming out through the Forest Service within the year. Now I'm going to take a brief break before we close out with our management recommendations to make sure there aren't any pressing questions. Thanks, Laura. <clears throat> uh, there's a comment from Colleen. It says, in Wisconsin, we are finding that balsam is a good companion for hemlock in that it camouflages seedlings against deer browse. It creates microsite conditions and then is released after the balsam mortality. 
So that um, is a really, uh, it's a good point, and it refers to what we call associational resistance. There's the idea that if you can grow um, species like eastern hemlock or northern white cedar, which are targeted by herbivores within a sort of complex of species that aren't so palatable that you can help those trees to um, survive through the stage where they would be heavily browsed. And part of the dynamic with fir and hemlock would be that the fir have a much shorter pathological longevity. Here in our region on poorly drained sites, we're looking at a maximum of 80 to 100, possibly 120 years, and those um, balsam fir will die of natural mortality. The hemlock can go for much longer. I think the challenge would be making sure you have well-established hemlock so they can maintain their position in the stand with the more competitive and faster-growing balsam fir, which, if dense enough, um, could uh, outcompete the hemlock and allocate them to a lower um, sort of canopy stratum in a developing stand. But that's a really good point about how we can manipulate species mixtures to address some of these issues. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks, Lord. Just one other quick question here from Dan. Is there an age or a metric to determine the cedar, excuse me, when cedar will start producing a good seed crop? Um, what this is, we haven't observed this directly, but based on the literature, I think that cedar starts producing when they are about 30 years old, um, but they don't seed reliably until after about 75 years old. So that's um, from the historical literature. I don't have observation of that myself. Great. Thanks. That's it for now. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Let's move on to looking forward and how we, what we suggest for management based on what we've been discussing about these two species. The research I've presented so far is based on our assessments of what has happened in the past, what has already gone on, but it's also important to look forward. The New England Forest Ecosystem Vulnerability Assessment and Synthesis is in preparation. This is led by Maria Genoiak. It is a product of the U.S. Forest Service, and it includes consideration of eastern hemlock and northern white cedar. Within the context of climate change, vulnerability is the susceptibility of a forest to adverse effects. It is a function of climate change impacts and adaptive capacity. An ecosystem is vulnerable if there is a risk of a shift in species composition that changes its character or if it is anticipated to suffer substantial declines in health or productivity. When we consider potential impacts of climate change broadly in our region, they include possible increased temperatures, as shown here in the diagram on the right, number of days over 90 degrees under different scenarios, longer growing seasons, changes in seasonality and type of precipitation, resulting changes in soil moisture patterns, and increased insect pests, pathogens, and invasives. Concerns specific to eastern hemlock and northern white cedar include drought stress from high evapotranspiration and seedling mortality from desiccation. We talked about both these species require a moist um, microsite for regeneration establishment and early growth. Elevation of the water table due to early and late season flooding can cause root asphyxia, growth delay, or mortality. In fact, researchers in Canada have suggested that the range of cedar will contract in both northern and southern directions due to this effect. Impacts from white-tailed deer may increase for both eastern hemlock and northern white cedar due to northward range expansion, though effects on tick effects of pardon me ticks parasites and associated diseases may mitigate that or make it unpredictable. So in some ways we're thinking, wow, maybe deer is going to be a bigger problem because their range will expand, but at the same time, ticks and other effects may limit that. So that's a bit of a question. As mentioned earlier, climate change means uh, northern expansion of the hemlock woolly adelgid, which could have profound negative impacts on hemlock in the northern portion of its range. Overall, most climate change scenarios suggest negative impacts for both hemlock and northern white cedar in our region. There isn't a magic bullet for that. 
When faced with uncertainties, managing for resilient and adaptive stands by maintaining trees of multiple species and developmental stages from young to old and maximizing vigor are recommended. Healthy and productive forests that have all their pieces have the greatest potential to respond to change. And I know this is a topic that Tony D'Amato uh, at the University of Vermont, Vermont has addressed in his recent work. So let's review some key points related to the management of hemlock and cedar. It was interesting that I found a number of commonalities between these two species related to similar silvical properties, including shade tolerance, slow growth, and the need for a moist regeneration substrate. Both species often originate beneath the canopy as advanced regeneration. They are long-lived and slow-growing, in partially cut stands, we saw from our data that it can take 30 years for eastern hemlock to reach one foot in height. And on average, across the region, northern white cedar takes about 100 years to reach pole size. Both species can withstand long periods of suppression and often show increasing growth as they respond to release and ascend into the canopy. They have the potential to respond to release even at advanced ages. Regeneration establishment in managed stands is most successful under a partial canopy, though growth rates increase with increasing light, especially for cedar. There are recruitment problems, as we've discussed, for hemlock and cedar in many stands due to slow growth and high vulnerability to browsing by deer. This varies by region and locality depending on herbivore population levels and availability of other foods. Both species are expected to face challenges with changing climate, in particular related to regeneration, due to the requirements for moist substrate and vulnerability of trees and seedlings on wet sites to early and late season flooding. Some things are different, however, for these two species. Eastern hemlock has to deal with the hemlock woolly adelgid, hemlock looper, and that whole other big list of things that I showed earlier. It currently has low value and generally poor product potential, which may limit our ability to actively manage hemlock in some areas. It also has relatively lower height growth than competitors as light increases. It is rapidly outcompeted by other shade tolerant conifers at anything less than about 80% canopy closure. Cedar trees, as I mentioned earlier, are very vulnerable to logging damage, which can lead to decay. Let's now turn to some recommendations. With regard to hemlock and cedar regeneration, we suggest that you take advantage of what is already there. This means establish to one foot in height, protect and release seedlings and saplings as advanced regeneration. When establishing new regeneration, it is important to control substrate and competition. Both species show preference for moisture holding substrates, such as highly decayed wood, if you have it, or exposed mineral soil. In Quebec, my colleagues are trying to establish cedar through scarification with the felling head of a machine or bulldozer on better drain sites. Also, browsing pressure must be considered. We had a suggestion earlier about associational resistance. That is worth considering. In addition, it might not make sense to manage for cedar or hemlock on sites where deer density is high. At least, don't consider regeneration there to be recruited until it is above browsing height, which is about 10 feet. And hold on to some seed trees for more than one rotation as insurance. With regard to tending, intermediate treatments such as thinning can be improved, used to improve the growth of existing shade-tolerant cedar and hemlock in lower strata. Even old trees can respond to release with better response expected if the live crown ratio is at least 33%. When pre-commercial thinning, we suggest releasing cedar specifically to improve growth and maintain species diversity because of its slow growth rates. It might not be a bad investment since cedar is now worth even more than spruce and fir in many areas. At a minimum, you need to treat cedar and hemlock as invisible species when they are infrequent in the understory during pre-commercial thinning because they're not strong competitors. So if you don't have a lot of them, 
at least don't cut them down or maybe favor them. And you, it's important to protect stems and roots during harvesting, especially for cedar. One way to accomplish these things is with an uneven-aged or multi-aged silvicultural system. This would include irregular shelter wood or selection system. Our work suggests that both would be appropriate for stands with hemlock or cedar, either as dominant species or in mixture with others. In irregular shelter wood, we suggest a multiple treatment approach where you have a list of alternative, alternatives that you apply as appropriate so that part of the stand is thinned, part of it is regenerated, etc. This allows you to adjust your treatment in response to spatial heterogeneity in composition and structure, which is common in mixed stands. Specifically, irregular shelter would, pr would protect, establish, and regeneration in some parts of the stand while tending others. It would create a stand that is diverse over space and time. There's been some um, good work out of Quebec on the irregular shelter wood and from Bob Seymour at UMaine. There's an excellent article in the Journal of Forestry on that topic. Selection cutting, as traditionally envisioned, would do many of these things at the same time, the tending, the releasing, the re regeneration, harvesting mature trees. It usually creates a more homogeneous stand condition in traditional application with small single tree canopy openings, which we found to be very, very suitable for eastern hemlock. Group selection or lower basal area could make the conditions more open. Some additional species-specific concerns. Given uh, hemlock woolly adelgid and other damaging agents, it seems especially important to manage for vigorous eastern hemlock trees. Management of cedar in anything but cedar-dominated stands likely involves identifying and treating micro-stands. Those are those patches of cedar that you find in mixed-species stands. They could be as small as two tree heights wide. Um, this enables you to make sure to manage for cedar even when it's not the focus of the overall treatment. In closing, this image is from a stand on the PEF that hasn't been harvested for at least 100 years, and it has a little bit of everything in it. I think this is very common for forests in our region. There are cedar, emergent pine, fir, hemlock, spruce, hardwood species, and it reminds me that what we've been discussing today is silviculture as applied ecology. Understanding as best we can how trees regenerate and grow so that we can use that to inform our management. There are tree species we can just cut and they will come back even more than when we started. One example of that in our region is red maple, which is a climate change winner, by the way. But neither hemlock nor cedar are those types of trees. If we want to manage them sustainably, you have to be thoughtful about their silvical requirements and whether the disturbance you are creating will facilitate their growth. And with that, I recognize my colleagues who contributed to this work and invite any final questions. Great. Thank you so much, Laura. And uh, thank you for sharing uh, all this information with us this morning. Uh, I'll give a minute to see if there are any questions that come in. Um, and just a reminder to folks, um, the, go ahead and type any questions into the question uh, box on your control panel. As folks are thinking about questions, I just uh, a couple of quick reminders. At the end of the webinar this morning, you will receive a uh, link to an evaluation survey. Please go ahead and take a few minutes to complete that survey. Uh, in addition, you will receive an email uh, follow-up from GoToWebinar asking you to complete the survey. Uh, if you complete it after the webinar this morning, there's no need to complete it a second time. Uh, it's just a uh, glitch in the system. Um, we, so we don't know whether or not you've completed it. So if you have, uh, just go ahead and ignore that follow-up email. If you don't get to it uh, after the webinar today, please, uh, please do try to complete that survey at another time. And then also, uh, just wanted to make a couple of quick announcements. Uh, as Laura mentioned, we have uh, another webinar coming up next month. We'll actually be focusing on oak. Mark Ashton, who is a professor of civiculture and forest ecology and director of school forests at Yale, will be joining us to continue the civicultural mini-series on oak. Uh, but then in June, we'll be joined by David Orwig, who will be uh, focusing a webinar on managing in hemlock woolly adelgid stands. So stay tuned for the date uh, on the June webinar. The May webinar with Mark Ashton is scheduled for May 31st, so uh, look for an announcement for me.
We do have a question here, Laura. Uh, when trying to establish cedar regeneration through partial cutting, is there a best target residual basal area or canopy closure? There is, um, and I mean, I'm right now I'm blanking off the top of my head, Beer, but uh, I think what we, we did in Quebec was a 25% removal from a um, 120 square feet per acre stand that was in the merchantable size classes was sufficient to establish regeneration. Um, up The shelter wood removal was also found to be effective and um, I'm sorry, I'm not remembering what that was exactly off the top of my head, but the idea is that you do a, an initial light entry and then you come back and open the, the stands later. And so the residual basal area that they used was a function of the percentage of overstory that they took out. And so if you had, you know, sometimes these cedar stands, you can carry a really high basal area, like over 200 square feet per acre. You wouldn't want to take that down to something less than 100. That would clearly be a, a bad plan and would likely result in um, wind throw. So um, as I said, doing something that is a percentage removal makes more sense based on the work that we've done. A minimum of 25% is recommended. Great, thanks, Laura. And uh, another quick sure. question from Robert: Is there is regular shelter wood the same as shelter wood with reserves? So irregular shelter wood, um, yeah. So there are similarities between these, and there is actually a lot of confusion about the terminology. The way that we're using regular shelter wood in this sense is to suggest a stand that it's it's a treatment that's somewhat in between a selection cut and a shelter wood cut. So it generally would result in a multi-aged rather than two-aged structure. So the old school uniform shelter wood with reserves is clearly a two-aged stand. Irregular shelter wood you often will maintain over time at least three age classes, but you don't do that by trying to create the traditional reverse J diameter distribution. You would, as needed in the stand, find places where there were mature trees to be removed. You would remove those. You would um, do some regeneration release as needed. You would do tending in other areas. So it's more of a, um, a spatial heterogeneous treatment, and it can be combined with the creation and expansion of gaps. That's how it's been applied. Um, here at the University of Maine by Bob Seymour and others. So there was a really excellent article in the Journal of Forestry a few years ago by Patricia Raymond and others that defines the different variants of irregular shelter wood um, with illustrations and examples, if anyone is interested. Great. Thank you so much, Laura. And uh, and thank you, everybody, for taking the time to join us this morning before you head out in the woods. I think this will go ahead and we'll go ahead and conclude this morning's webinar. Um, thank you again, Laura, for your presentation this morning. And just a reminder, folks, uh, we hope to see you on May 31st with the presentation from Mark Ashton uh, continuing the series looking uh, at oak. So thanks again, everybody, for taking the time to join us this morning and look to see you in May. Have a good day. Thank you all.